EP1100 Data Communication and Computer Networks. In this module, I will go over shared access links, a link where there are several senders and perhaps several receivers. The complication is not with the multiple receivers, but rather with the multiple senders. Because if you have more receivers, all you need to know is to have an address in the frame so that uh, each receiver can say whether a frame is destined for itself or whether someone else should receive it. But let's look at what happens when we have multiple senders. We assume here that the link is asynchronous, which means that there is no signal unless there is frame being sent. Recall that asynchronous frames are preceded by a preamble, which allows the receiver to uh, log on to the sending clock and sample the waveform at the appropriate times. Since it's a shared link, we can have different number of senders, and the senders could be of different sorts, meaning that they have different needs for sending data. They could have different processes that need to communicate more or less, and therefore they're sharing the link, but to different amounts. Since it's one link, if two or more would send at the same time, they would interfere. So we assume here that the interfering transmissions are useless. We refer to it as a collision. Furthermore, assume that we use a regular stop and wait ARQ. So what can happen when the senders transmit? Does the ARQ function as intended? So let's look into that. Let's assume a setup of one uh, radio link with three nodes. I have drawn the link here as two arrows, but it's really the same radio link, meaning that they communicate in the same frequency band. So the two senders communicate with one receiver, and we assume also that the communication is full duplex, meaning that all the entities can send and receive at the same time. We have the time axis now extended with the time axis also for sender B. So both sender A and sender B will send towards the middle time axis the receiver. Sender A sends a frame to the receiver and it's acknowledged. Sender B sends a frame to the receiver and it's acknowledged. So it works as we hoped it to. Let's look at another example. Sender A sends a frame, oh, sender B sends a frame and they collide. So at the receiver, the receiver would first have seen the preamble of the frame from A, where I've logged into it. If it was managed to receive the header, it would have a length field, how many bytes of data it should collect before the end of frame is reached, and where it finds the CRC to verify the frame. When the collision occurs, the data they will receive would be interfered by the frame from sender B. And the checksum from the CRC will result in, in a detection of, uh, of uh, errors in, in the frame from A. The frame from B will not even be detected because its preamble comes during the transmission of frame A. But we have an ARQ, right? So what happens? Well, they do a timeout and then they retransmit. And oh, look, they will collide again. Since the timeout is deterministic, once they've collided, they will continue to retransmit with the same offset and collide each time from there on. So ARQ, as it's given from the data link protocol, doesn't work as intended. So we have to do some change to the protocol so that it works also for this setting where we have two or more senders. So if they are synchronized with respect to the collision and uh, the timeout, we can add a random time so that they don't try to retransmit at the same time. Let's look how that can work. So they have the previous case of the collision. Sender A times out, sender B times out, once a random time, and then retransmit. Here, the sender A, even though it was first, it, it draw a random time which was longer than the waiting time that sender B took. And therefore, actually sender B will have its frame transmitted before sender A. Let's look at another case. We have the same situation. Timeout, random waiting time, and uh, B retransmit and A retransmit. But still, there is a collision. So we see that the random waiting time that we introduced, it avoids collision by certainty, but it doesn't eliminate collision. So in this particular case, I illustrated that collisions can still occur even though we have this random waiting time. So we have a multiple access link with collisions. So we use a standard stop and wait ARQ with random waiting times. Stop and wait is efficient if the transmission time of the frame is much, much 
longer than the propagation time, which is the case for many small networks like local area networks. The more data the senders have to transmit, the higher the probability of collision becomes. And the retransmission of the timeout plus the random waiting time is not efficient because uh, the link is not used for that time until they try again. The protocol as described is called the ALOA protocol. This was invented for radio networks in the 1970s at the University of Hawaii. The efficiency of this protocol is not very high. Under some reasonable assumptions, you can compute the throughput and it saturates at 18% of the link capacity. It also has an unstable property that if you increase the, the offered traffic beyond that peak, the throughput actually goes down because the collisions are occurring all the time. So how can we make the protocol more efficient? Well, remember that the link was full duplex. Why don't you listen before transmitting? This is how we do it in our regular life. If someone is talking, you don't interfere and start talking at the same time. You wait until the other person has finished his or her sentence and then you introduce what you want to say. We add that to the protocol. We don't send if someone else is sending. This can at least avoid overlaps with frames that can be detected to be on the link. This is called carrier sense and it simply means that you listen on the medium before you send. If there is no carrier signal on the medium, then you determine that the medium is idle and therefore you can send. This reduces the probability of collisions, as I will show. So we are back to the time axis with A and B sending to receive the receiver in the middle. Now I've drawn the frame for its full propagation because the frame from sender A reaches the receiver, but if sender B is close enough to sender A, it will also reach sender B. If B gets a frame to send, it will sense the medium and see that it's busy because it sees that if there's a frame coming from A. That frame is completely transmitted by A to the receiver and the receiver sends an acknowledgement and also that acknowledgement is heard by the sender B. Now sender B senses the medium and sees that it's idle, so it transmits its frame towards the receiver, which also reaches sender A. So if sender A would have another frame to transmit, it would sense the medium first and see that it is busy, and then when it becomes free, then it will send a frame. So does this resolve all collisions? Let's see. So we have the previous case, A sending and B detecting that. Now both A and B have a frame to send. So once the acknowledgement from the receiver has reached A and B, from there on the channel is idle. So they both sense it as being free and they can both transmit and of course they collide. So we got the synchronization here between A and B and there's nothing they could have sensed to know that both A and B decides to send after the channel has been idle for some measured period. So we have to deal with this case as well. The carrier sense does not eliminate collisions. There is a much smaller time window that collisions can occur now when we're sensing the medium compared to the lower case when there was no carrier sense at all. It also assumes that all nodes hear one another. This works well for wired networks where all nodes are connected to the same link as a coaxial cable for instance. Or it works for small scale radio communication networks, for instance what's used for Wi-Fi. But what we saw in the previous example was that the busy medium synchronizes subsequent transmission because everyone who wants to transmit sees that there is activity on the link, someone is sending, and then it goes idle and they measure that it's idle for a certain time and after that they start to transmit and they will collide with certainty. So we need to resolve that. This is called a persistent strategy. And what we described is called a one persistent strategy. It follows the flow diagram here that the arrow from top means that there is a frame to be transmitted. You sense the carrier for some amount of time to determine whether it's idle or not. If it's busy, well, you go back and sensing and eventually it becomes idle and then you can send the frame. This is what I showed led to a collision if two or more nodes are busy. 
Another alternative is non-persistent transfer. Since the carrier as before, if it's busy, then you wait a random amount of time before you sense again. This means that the channel will be sampled at different times for different senders. And one sender will see the channel being idle before other senders and it will start transmitting before the others and they will sense that the channel is busy once they try to see if they can send their frame. So here's an illustration of this non-persistent CSMA. We have the previous case that uh, sender A sends the frame to the receiver, it propagates to B, and B senses that it's busy. So since it's non-persistent, it selects a random waiting time. After this random waiting time, it senses that the channel is free, and it sends its frame. The non-persistent CSMA has a capture effect that I can show this way. A sends a frame to B, B sends that the channel is busy, selects a random waiting time, which is fairly long in this case. Turn out that sender A had another frame to send. So after it has received the acknowledgement for the previous frame, it senses the channel, sees that it's free, sends frame number two. B senses the channel after this random waiting time, sees that the channel is busy, selects a new random waiting time, a gets acknowledgement of the previous frame, has another frame to send, senses the medium, sees that it's free, and therefore sends another frame. So this way, A has captured access to the link and, and has been able to send three times while B has not been able to send a single frame. The capture effect could have been avoided by requiring also A to wait a random time before it senses the medium to send its second frame and the same again before it sends the third frame. But all these random waiting times introduce inefficiencies because during the waiting times the link is not used by anyone. So there's a trade-off between how likely it is to have capture or have collisions and how long waiting times you should introduce to resolve potential problems that can occur. There is one further improvement to the carrier sense multiple access that I want to show. It's called collision detection. It requires the sender to listen also while sending. And then it can detect if it's the only transmitter at the, that time or whether there are others transmitting at the same time. If there are others transmitting, it detects very early that there is a collision. Often a few bytes of the frame are sufficient to detect that the collision has occurred. This doesn't reduce the probability of collision, but it reduces the time cost of a collision because a collision is detected early, while in regular CSMA without collision detection, you only detect that collision has occurred by the absence of an acknowledgement after the full frame has been transmitted. There is a back of a repeat strategy where you draw a random waiting time before trying again to send the frame. And if there are repeated collisions, then this waiting time is drawn from an interval which doubles by each collision that has occurred for one and the same frame. Collision detection is not suitable for radio links because the transmitted signal is much, much stronger than the received signal from the other stations due to the high attenuation of the radio medium. Here is an illustration of carrier sense multiple axis with collision detection. So you see that A sends a frame and B also sends a frame. At the time when B started to, to send its frame, it could not have known that A was already sending a frame because the first bit of the frame from A had not reached B. When the first bits of the frame from A reaches B, then B will sense that there is a collision and therefore it will stop sending its frame. At some point also A will detect that there is a collision and will stop sending the frame. There is no purpose of sending the full frame if a collision has been detected. They then wait a random time, sense the medium again and then attempt to send again. And here B selected a shorter waiting time than A and therefore got to transmit its frame before A.